this week on the Back Table Podcast. I encourage all the, the audience to do it. It's, it's very important. Okay. And uh, it's a very simple and cheap procedure. And it's going to change the life of this woman forever. You know, for those who have kids, they know how important it is to have kids, right? And these women are trying for years and years or months, and they want to, to get pregnant. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular and minimally invasive. If you're a new listener, welcome. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back and thank you for listening. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or our website, backtable.com. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a written review, or reach out to us on social media. Just let us know how we can make this podcast a better resource for our community, and we're going to do our best to make that happen. Before we dive into our topic today, just want to say a quick word from our sponsor, RadPad. RadPad radiation protection products developed by physicians for physicians and clinically proven to protect during CINE and digital subtraction angiography. Don't bet your health on anything less. Trust RadPad protection for all your interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com to learn more about radiation safety CME credits for you and your team. Today, we're going to be talking about fallopian tube recanalizations. We have Dr. Renato Abuhana with us today. And he's going to be helping us with the discussion. So um, Dr. Hanna has uh, an interesting background. I'm going to leave it to him to kind of walk us through about where he's at in his practice. And then we're going to jump into the discussion. So Renato, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for the inviting me for to be here. I'm a great fan of the Back Day po podcast, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Dude, forget that. We thank you for coming on the show. <laughs> All right. So tell us... Um, a little bit about where you are in your practice. I know that you're still in Canada, uh, finishing out an abdominal MRI fellowship, but I've also known that you have a couple other fellowships in the bag already. So can you kind of tell the audience about kind of how you got to where you're, you are and what your practice looks like right now? Sure. So basically I did my medical school and the residency in Brazil, where I came from. In 2017, I moved to Canada, where I have done a postdoctoral research fellowship in IR at the Université de Montréal. And then after that, I did my IR training at McGill University, followed by abdominal imaging and again, IR at McGill University. And finally, currently doing body MR also at McGill. So after all this training, you're going to be like the best trained radiologist in <laughs> Canada. So I'm sure that like some place is going to be very interested in scooping you up. And I'm sure there's plenty of places stateside that'd be happy to have you too. I hope so. I hope so. For, for those uh, listeners who aren't as familiar with this topic, can you kind of just give an overview of what fallopian tube recanalization is? To talk about fallopian tube recanalization, we need to go back for the HSG, which means hysterosalpingogram, right? And uh, mm -hmm. what's, uh, what's the hysterosalpingogram? Some people don't do that. And that was, was quite interesting because I was, uh, I was doing the, the HST since my, my residency. When I came to Canada, I realized that they were doing the same here, but they are also doing the recanalization. So I was getting more interested on in doing that. But basically the recanalization of the fallopian tube is when you do the HST and you realize that one or maybe bilateral tubes are blocked and you can use some techniques to open it in order to, to, to get more chance of, of pregnancy for these infertile ladies, right? So that's basically what the fallopian tube recanalization is about. So this is a procedure ge geared towards uh, assisting with infertility in, in patients who are having uh, difficulty getting pregnant. And yes. the first component of it is like the HSG, where you're just like taking pictures by injecting contrast in the uterus, right? Exactly. Just uh, for interest, if you go back to the history, actually, the HSG is a very old procedure. It was done uh, after 15 years after Hotting and Scover X-ray, the first HSG was already reported. And the recanalization came even before that. It's dated 1849 when a guy like from London, he just inserted a J-shaped cannula to clean the tube. So since that time, they know that the, the tube can be blocked by mucus. That's what we see is nowadays. And the, since 1963, the techniques has been improved and improved it. And of course, uh, the outcome is getting better. And that it's where we are right now. 
Did you say the first one was done in 18 something? Did you say 1860? 1849, but it was not with, with fluoro guidance. The guy, they, they knew that right. the tube was. <laughs> there was, was, there uh, was no fluoro guidance, right? Exactly. That was just the recanalization because they, they, they knew it since that point that the, the tube can be blocked by mucus. So they use a T-shaped cannula just to canalize it and, and, and clean it. So they knew a long time that the, the mucus can block the tubes and cause infertility. And that's we, what we do wow. now, right? And then since 1963, the, the AGST start to be more used. Okay. Well, I hope that the technique has come uh, slightly further than what we were seeing in, in 1850s. Um, <laughs> so we'll kind of get into it. Launching into the pre-procedure side of it, how do these patients get referred to you and what it, like, what exactly is the referral pattern? And when they are referred to you, how do they present? Is it uh, as an HSG or do they show up to like an IR clinic beforehand? Yeah. So, oh, that's a great question. So the indication, major, the major indication nowadays in the fertility, because we know that in the past, the HST, they have more indications usually for, uh, to see, to looking for anomaly in the uterus, to looking for adenomyosis, for myoma, but nowadays it, they can go for an MRI or ultrasound and that's it. So the HST is basically to rule out fallopian tube obstruction, right? When the, this patient came to us, the majority of the indications for infertility, some of them have already the HST done outside clinics, in, in other clinics, by other radiologists, or even some places by gynecologists as well. And uh, some of them came for indication directly for recanalization, but other ones came for HST. But even though the first step of the procedure is doing HST. So it doesn't matter if the patient comes straight for recanalization or for, or for HST, we're going to do the same pathway. Okay. And so whenever they see you guys first, is it in the clinical setting or is it actually for the day of their procedure? It's from the day of the procedure. So basically, gotcha. uh, we get the referral from the gynecologist, our, our secretary is going to call the patient. Okay. They're going to tell you, okay, we have a, we're going to do a HST or maybe further, uh, re uh, recanalization. So they're going to give them the pathway to follow up. So the pathway is the HST or the recanalization need to be done between the six and 10 days of the starting of their menses. So the secretary will tell them, call us back between these days. And we're going to schedule your exam right away. Doing this, we don't need to ask for a pregnancy test because uh, they're in their menses. And then we're going to, it's going to go through the, what we recommend before the procedure. What we recommend before the procedure is giving antibiotic therapy. We, we give doxycycline twice a day for five days. They can start two days before the procedure. And we also tell them to take ibuprofen before the procedure to reduce the, the pain. At the day of the procedure is the first time we see the patients. Got it. Just to drill down on a couple of the things that you said for the audience is timing of the actual recanalization six to 10 days after their first day of um, their cycle. Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Even for HST and the recanalization. Right. And then pre-procedural antibiotics, doxycycline. And uh, would you tell me, would you just uh, enlighten us as what's the dose of that? Uh, 100 milligram twice a day for five days five days. And then you start that two days before the procedure and then you continue it. Three days after. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Okay. So once the patients are, uh, once the patients are there for the day of the procedure, is it moderate sedation, local, MAC? Usually no sedation. Okay. We usually okay. for HSG, we don't use sedation. Some patients require it and we might need to use a low, low dose of uh, conscious sedation, mm -hmm. but usually not. But the main point of this is, is talking to the patient, is patient communication. And this is very important. So this, you're going to see this patient for the first time when you get to the room. And you need to, to understand that this patient, they are under stress. They are very emotional. So these ladies, they're trying to get pregnant for a month, for years. They're very sensitive. And the first thing they do when they, they tell them to do a HSD, they go to Google, right? And if you go to Google and you type HST, you're going to be scared. Some patients say that's the worst pain in the world. Uh, some patients get faint during the procedure. So they're very, very scared. They're very stressed. Uh -huh. So it's very important before the procedure 
what, what I do is, so my tech start to prep in the patient. So I go in, into the room, I present myself and I start to talk about the procedure and I explain step by step. I tell them, I compare it for a gynecological examination. So I tell them, listen, it's going to do very similar to a gynecological exam. Uh, you're going to be in the position. We're going to insert the, the speculum in your vagina, and then we're going to proceed with the procedure. Uh, and I ask her, have you had this speculum before? Yes. It was painful. No, it was, was, was smooth. Okay. We're going to do the same today. Have you had the pap test before? Yes. So they, they brush it, right? We're going to do the same. You're going to insert a very thin catheter inside your cervix. So don't be scared. It's going to be okay. So try to relax them, try to talk to them and explain the procedure. Other thing it's important for those that never did the ADSD before is beside that, if I explain this to this patient, ask them to not move during the procedure. Sometimes they get, they get start to have cramps and, and pain and they move, or sometimes they cover the uterus with their hands and then you lose your images. It's very important to explain that to this patient. And again, talk and talk and talk. Some patients, they came from different parts of the world, different cultures and different religions. And we need to respect that. Some patients, they are not comfortable or doing this, this especially with men, right? So it's very important to go very easily and understand that this is, this is not peak line, this is not central line. We are doing basic a gynecological exam. So that's, that's the main point here. And then after, uh, after I explain that, my tech probably end off cleaning and draping the patient. And then I go for to start the, the the procedure itself. I think that's I think that's a great job. I think one to appreciate that one patients would be coming from all over with a high degree of anxiety from a lot of different culture and socioeconomic backgrounds, and then also to use some of their prior experiences with like other GYN exams or Pap smears to like give them a, a level of familiarity and comfort and something that like seems very scary to them. That's, that's, it that seems like a, a good way to reduce the anxiety with something that can seem very daunting when you show up on the first day. So will you talk a little bit about where you do this procedure? And I know it's under x-ray, but like the positioning of the patient. And so are there any uh, special uh, modifications that you make to your fluoro table, either with like the patient positioning or stirrups being on the table that make it a little bit easier? Yeah. So basically you need to put the patient in the gynecological position and bring mm -hmm. as down as possible. You usually put something under the pelvis just to elevate it a little bit and try to, to bring her down uh, in terms to get easier access uh, to insert the speculum and the, to localize the cervix basically. And as far as like the lithotomy position, like there are uh, stirrups that you can just attach to the table. Yeah, we do it and around the legs as well, just to get more sterile uh, fueled, but uh, it's pretty much all. All right. Can you talk about just uh, the actual uh, speculum insertion and like how to identify the cervix? Because I, I think once we get into actual technical components of fallopian tube recan, I think that that makes sense to a lot of IRs. I think even if you've never done one, like if you looked at the pictures of how to do one and after hearing you explain it, it's very straightforward, but there's some interventional radiologists who have never, never done like a pelvic exam. So can you talk a little bit about the challenge into just identifying the cervix and cannulating the cervix? Yeah, so after cleaning and draping the patient, the next step is inserting the, the speculum, right? We have, uh, we have a plastic and a metallic ones. Uh, just to remember, uh, if you have a metallic one, try to warm up a little bit in your hands. Hold it for a no good 40, 45 seconds to make it a little bit warmer before inserted. Again, this patient, you know, if you insert it a very cold, uh, is back on her, they're going to contract her, their legs, they're going to gonna make everything more difficult for you. So warm it up. And then basically the speculum insertion, uh, you need to find the cervix, right? And then this can be challenged. It depends on the position of the uterus, depends on the size of the patient, can be challenging. So the, the way you do it, try to go more posteriorly, and then I start to open up and move it up, move it up until the, the cervix shows up in the middle of the speculum. That's the way I do it. But sometimes it can be tricky. Sometimes it's a, it's a laterally and you can't find it very well. And sometimes you need, even need to, to do like a digital exam to find it. And then, okay, it's laterally, it's left. So I can, I can, I know where to, to insert my speculum. But you know, after you're doing this uh, a couple of times, you're going to be, it's going to be easy. As far as any uh, cervical maneuvers, is there any need uh, with uh, cervical cannulation to involve like a tentaculum or anything to like anchor the cervix uh, to keep it from pushing away from you have, as you're trying to access the os? Yeah, so you can use tentaculum. I mean, uh, can be very painful. I, I have used 
in the past, uh, I can say a few times, sometimes patients refer a lot of pain. Other ones, they feel absolutely no pain with the tenaculum. Tenaculum is basically a sharp pointed forceps that you can grab the cervix and help you, you know, in order to insert your, your catheter in. But I try not to use it. I try not to use it. If you have, a, you know, if you go easily with some kind of, uh, of catheters, I don't think it's needed, but we, we can use it in, in some situations. So after I, I cannulated, I, I mean, after I started speculum, then I, I proceed with the cervix cleaning. I clean well the cervix, and then I try to cannulate with my catheter balloon. And there's many, many types of catheter that you can use. You can use a silicon Foley catheter, like eight French silicon uh, Foley catheter, just to gently insert into the canal. And then once you're in the cavity, you inflate your balloon. Or you can have a, a dedicated catheters. I like a lot the Aragon one. They have a 5.5 uh, uh, French catheter, uh, balloon catheter, that there is a, like a cannula around it that you can literally cannulate the cervix and then advance the catheter inside the, the uterine cavity. And there's a 2 ml balloon. I like to use this a lot. And then once you inflate the balloon, you're going to pull back in order to occlude the cervical canal, right? So you're going to insert it, inflate the balloon, and then you pull back. And every time I'm doing this, I'm telling the patient what I'm doing to make just more relaxed, okay? Then I tell her, so now I'm inserting the, the, the catheter and, and they tell everything. So after I inserted the balloon, I'll pull back the, the balloon to close the, the cervical canal and also to straight the uterus ca the uterine cavity. And then after that, I will proceed with the contrast injection. Okay. So to summarize in terms of uh, cervical cannulation, anything between an eight and a five French catheter, preferably with a balloon on the end so you can inflate the balloon, pull it against the internal cervical os, and that way you create a seal in which you can now inject contrast into a, a semi-closed system and start to opacify the uterine cavity, right? That's perfect, yeah. Okay, so you mentioned the Argon set. I'll also go ahead and say that it, I know that Cook has two sets of fallopian exactly. tube catheterization mm -hmm. sets. And and like anything in interventional radiology, it, there's a lot of different tools that get the same job done. Exactly. So after you have cannulated the, the cervix and you have the balloon inflated and pulled against the cervical os, you've prepped the patient, you inject the contrast. Will you kind of describe, is it a real forceful injection? Is it a gentle injection? What's the contrast dilution? Yeah, so basically I get a 20 cc syringe. I dilute it like 50-50 with contrast. And I mm -hmm. do a, a, a slow but progressive injection. It's very important to to not inject it fast or hard because otherwise patient's gonna, gonna cramp, they're gonna have a lot of pain, and you can, you're probably gonna have some spasm in the tube. So you will not see it. So go, go gently, slowly and progressive pressure injection. You're going to feel some pressure, which is normal. And we want it, we want it in order to, to fill the, the tubes. So you're going to feel all the uterine cavity and then the fallopian tubes. You're going to see it bilaterally. And then you're going to see all the way down the fallopian tubes and the free spillage of contrast in the peritoneum. That's the normal HSG. That's the, the, the regular exam that, that we are doing. And then you go for the abnormal findings that you can see in the, in the, in the HST, then uh, more than, than just the, the fallopian tube obstruction. So remember, we're doing a HST basically to see if the tubes are, are blockage or not, but it's an sure. exam and you need to report it. So if you see an abnormality, let's say in the uterine sh shape that can be related to arcuate uterus, unicorn uterus, probably they know it, but if they know, you can, you know, recommend the MRI. Also, if you see some filling defect inside the, inside the uterine cavity, it can be related to endometrial polyps, synechia, or even lyomyoma, so mucosal types of lyomyoma, and even adenomyosis we can also see by, by HSG. So just keep this in your head that when you, need, when you read it, we need to describe all those findings as well, not just, okay, the tubes are open or not. It's more than that, okay? Just to, sure. to keep this in, in mind. Like, right, there's a diagnostic component to this. Exactly. And, and that's, exactly. that's similar to angiograms, too. Like, I mean, we always need to keep our eyes open for, I don't know, vascular findings during our IR procedures that are vascular. So, no, that makes sense. So, once you've done the diagnostic portion, you've identified, well, can you kind of talk about the patterns of tubal occlusion that you might see and which ones are more amenable to intervention than others? Yeah, so basically what you're looking for is the occlusion or not. And 
when we see it, the majority of the case, they are proximal occlusion. Usually they are proximal occlusion. And also they can be related to, can be associated with hydrosalpings as well. But usually uh, we, we can have proximal or distal. The distal can be related more for prior history of surgery or other procedures, but uh, usually what we see, it's a proximal occlusion. That's uh, which one we e usually attempt to, to reopening. Hey, back to the listeners. This is Aaron Fritz. Before we move on with the episode, I want to tell you about a new show coming out on the Backtable Network this December. It's the Backtable Innovation Show, where hosts Brian Hartley, Eric Gantwerger, and myself will be bringing you stories from physician innovators and medtech founders who are helping to shape medicine through health tech. We received so much great feedback from the innovation series over the last year, with episodes like the origin story of the Palma stents with Julio Palmez and starting a medtech company with Mahmoud Razavi that we decided to make a whole show dedicated to showcasing the vibrant entrepreneurial spirit of these individuals and hopefully inspire others. Keep an eye out for it wherever you get your podcast, iTunes, Spotify, or Backtable.com. And be sure to follow the new show at underscore Backtable INN on Twitter and Instagram for the latest. So if you identify a proximal occlusion bilaterally, What's the next step in terms of, of recanalization? Yeah, perfect. So we did our HST, let's say we have uh, our occlusion. So my next step is doing a selective salpingography. Okay, so at this point, let's say you have the left side is occluded, the right side is perfectly open and the free split of contracts of the peritoneum. So uh, once I have done this, my second step is to do a uh, selective salpingography which I, I, I prefer to use like a short diagnostic catheter. I like the KMP, for example. So the way I do is I'm, I'm going to deflate the balloon, take out that the catheter and get a five French KMP and I will place it at the tubal ostium, okay? At exactly in the cornua. And then I will perform selective injection. Again, at this point, very small amount of contrast, a few mLs will be enough. Is slowly and progressive injection. You're gonna feel pressure at this point because they're occluded, right? But you can just slowly, slowly inject your contrast and try to opacify the, the the tube. So you can have two results from this. You can open it, and sometimes you feel it. You feel the pressure. You feel that you have pressure, 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 and then release it. So why? Because there was mucus on the tube, and you were able just to open just injecting contrast. It's 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 very fast and easy to do it. You just place your catheter, inject it slowly, and you're gonna see it's opening. Or you're gonna you're gonna inject and it remains occluded. Then you need to proceed for the recanalization by itself. How often does it happen where you're injecting and then you just feel like a, a pressure release and you actually open up the tube that way? It's it's quite it's very very common to be honest with you. Even with okay. the even during the HSG, if you don't need to do a salpingography, sometimes you are injecting contrast, you're gonna see let's like, say the right side is completely open, and then the left side is occluded. But you keep keep doing a gentle pressure, and poof, it's gonna open and opacify everything. It's it, okay. it happens very very often. That's why in the past they used to say that HSG was a type of uh, therapeutic exam for patients who are trying to get pregnant. And the patient come to you and say, you know, I, I hope I can get pregnant of this, this HST because they know it and the gynecologist, the gynae people know that after the HST, there's increased chance of getting pregnant. Yeah. So say you're not able to release it with just a, a, a gentle injection. So what's the next step after that? It, do you add on like, now do you get a little more serious adding any extra tools or you're still using the, I think you said, a KMP catheter, which is like a little, it's a similar to a Cumpy where it's just got a small angled end. Yeah. So at this point, I will stop and talk to the patient. I will see how the patient is doing. If the patient has a lot of pain and she, she might want to stop the procedure. So I talk to them. I say, listen, one of your tubes is occluded and uh, I can try to reopen now if you want. How are you feeling? Are you feeling okay? You want to do this another day or should we go ahead? Some of them will say, no, I don't want to do this right now. And I do next time with sedation. Or some of them will say, yeah, go ahead and open it because they are very anxious to get pregnant, right? And they want to do everything to, to get that done. So, and then I said, okay, so we're going to go ahead and do it. And there's two ways to do it. 
you can uh, you can use dedicated catheters. And uh, as you said, the cook, they have a very nice uh, a set for this recanalization set that comes with uh, a coaxial sheath. It's a nine French coaxial th- sheath that gave you support to place your 5.5 French catheter in the, at the corner. And they also have a micro catheter and a micro uh, cape mandrel wire in the kit that you use to recanalize it. I like this kit. It's it's give you a nice stability. However, despite the, the fact it's more expensive, also it's a little bit more tricky to handle because you have to handle all those catheters. And remember, mm-hmm. you're, you're in the gynecological position. You don't have your table right, right beside you and you're inside the uterine cavity. You're not inside a vessel. So the catheter flop out and uh, it's not a very stable position, right? So it can, can be a little bit tricky, but you can use it and, and it works very well. And the other way I do it, that's it's very, very simple. And I learned here with Dr. Boucher at McGill University that worked very well. And I'm doing this for a while now. Once I have my KMP right in place, I do my, my salpingography. It's blocked. I take right away to room wire and I like to, to get the stiff to room wire because it's flop enough, it's not damaged the tool, but it's, it's stiff enough to give you support in the uterine cavity and to advance all the way to the, into the fallopian tube. And then from there, it's just a question of playing with the wire, trying to cross those, the occlusion. And once you cross it, you advance it gently all the way down and that's it. So it's a very, it's very simple procedure, works very well. And if it doesn't work, with the stiff to room, then I might, I might try with the catheter, the recanalization set, or I get a micro catheter and a micro wiring in order to try to cross the, the occlusion. And so just to drill down on a couple points here. So whenever you're talking about recanalization, if you simply cannulate with like a little KMP catheter, and then with a stiff glide wire from Turumo, you're able to get by the obstruction. That's all you need. Like there's no devices after that. Just having the wire pass through the obstruction is the exactly. recanalization, correct? Is the recanalization, exactly. And so say the, the stiff glide doesn't work and then you have to back up and then basically what you're describing is like using the, the cook set where you get the sheath in, where you get a five French sheath at the ostium. And then you're talking about using like a three French micro catheter to, and, and micro wire to get past the obstruction. Yes, exactly. That's, that's what comes with the kit and, and also you can use other micro catheters, but this, this works pretty well. And there is like a, a cope mandrel wire in the kit. It's a 08, 015, if I'm not wrong. And then, uh, which is also a little bit stiff and you can, you can play with that because if you, if you get like a uh, regular, you can use an other, other wires, but uh, remember you don't have much stability in this situation. So if you have a little bit stiff in the wire, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be more easier to, to play with that. So if you just get the micro wire to go by, does that count as recanalization or do you then have to, I, I guess I'm just wanting to drill down on the details. Do you have to like spin the wire aggressively to try and clean out the mucus or just having the wire bypass the obstruction counts as a recan? Yeah. Usually if you, if you cross it. And then after that, you're going to retool your, your injection, right? And then mm-hmm. once you break it with your wire, after you inject contrast, the pressure will clean it by itself. Okay. So okay. usually that's all you need. That's all you need. Other examples also, sometimes you have some scars and then it's, it's tough to break it, especially like just pushing with the wire. Right. And in some cases, especially patient with hydrosalpings, we, we, you know, that some scary scars in the proximally. It's very debatable of using a balloon plastic for that. Okay. Mm-hmm. To be honest, it's my, my last option. I don't like to use balloon in this, in these situations, but I have done, uh, a couple of times using like a two millimeter, uh, steering balloon from Boston scientific or something just in order to open it a little bit, but it's not my for in, we will not be my first uh, attempt. I will open it and let it go. If the patient came back and I, and I know that's by scar, I might try to open it again, maybe using a balloon, but otherwise not. Okay. Can we talk about some of the challenges that come up with working in the uterine cavity? You kind of mentioned one of them and, uh, or actually two of them that I think are worth talking about a little bit more in that if you're upgrading to this uterine or the fallopian tube catheterization set, you have a nine French sheath in, a five French catheter, and then a three French micro catheter. 
how do you handle all this? Like, it seems like it would just be cumbersome. Like, what's your positioning and like how much is external to the patient? Like, are there, can you kind of give the audience, like paint them like a, a, a picture of like what you do to manage all these things? Or like, do you always need a second set of hands to kind of like hold like uh, the non-French sheath in position? Because I could see where like without a back table, all this stuff would just kind of be laying in your lap. And it, exactly. you know, it seems like that, that alone is a challenge. Right, exactly. So I basically try to hold uh, the, the nine French and the five French uh, with my left hand. And then with my right hand, I will play with the wire and maybe holding the, the micro catheter or maybe holding the micro catheter also with my left hand and play the wire with my right hand. But as I said, it's very, it's, it's tricky position. We don't have where to hold it, but basically I will hold all the sheet and catheter with my left hand and try to play with my right hand in order to cross the stenosis. And once I do it, I do this, I, I might advance the micro catheter over the wire or in order to have more support. Gotcha. Is there ever any utility, like if you're able to get the micro wire to go distally and pass the obstruction, is there any utility in also advancing the micro wire, or I'm sorry, the micro catheter distally, or does that not add anything to the procedure? Usually I do, trying to, you know, to break the, the, the scars and all, or, or if it's not scarred to push a bit of the, the, the mucus down and then I inject and slowly pull back the catheter and see if it's everything's open and, and well. Okay. All right. That makes sense. So if you have one side that's open and one side that that's closed, clearly you just recannulate the one side, right? Yes. Yes. And if you have bilateral obstruction, do you always recannulate both sides? Both sides. I go for this, for the other side right away. And the same procedure. Okay, gotcha. If the patient is doing same well, setting. I go, yeah. yeah, same setting. Same okay. setting. So once you've recanned uh, both sites, uh, what's next? So you're done. You're going to take your pictures and and basically you're done. So after that, you're going to tell the patient, you know, to retry to get pregnant after 48 hours, keep the antibiotic for the next three days, uh, and then you go for our outcomes, right? So tell them about our complications also, right? We can have complications from mm -hmm. this procedure, especially when you're doing recanalization. Even though they are very unusual and of little clinical significance, they exist. So it's important to tell the patient that they may have some bleeding after the procedure. It's just a uh, light spotting that can uh, stay for 24 hours. You can need to tell them about infection, even though it's uh, very little because you, you are giving them antibiotic. And uh, you can have also tubal perforation. It's very rare. It's up to 2% of the procedure. And if you have a, a perforation, don't worry, it's going to heal by itself. So just let it go and it's going to heal. Other thing that's important to comment on this is some patient can have a vasovagal, okay? So that's why I'm telling you, inject it slowly and try to make the patient as comfortable as possible. But you, you, you can have vasovagal and I had a few times and it's a nightmare because the patient is going to drop the legs on you and you have your speculum inside, you have your catheter inside the patient and you need to take it out and need to close your speckle, and it's it's not that easy. So we need to do everything is possible to to avoid it. And finally, important thing to comment is about the radiation exposure. So this patient here trying to get pregnant, and we need to minimize as much as possible the radiation exposure. So for a regular HST, I can tell you I have uh, we're gonna do like uh, twenty seconds of fluoro maximum. It's it's a minimal. Mm -hmm. It's a minimal, minimal, minimal. Sure. Uh, fluoro time for a normal. Of course, for recanalization, you might have to use more fluoro, but try to use as minimal as possible. I think that's that's important to say. Right. That you minimize the actual actual radiation dose. I was actually interested in that, like earlier, you mentioned that a metal speculum and plastic speculum, both are fair game. I guess going back to that, uh, the metal speculum, I just assumed would kind of interfere with the pictures in some way, but... I guess the speculum doesn't always overlap with like the positioning of the uterus and certainly not with the fallopian tubes. Exactly. So basically it okay. can, uh, can be in the cervix there. Sometimes it can have some artifact, but not for the tubes, but for sometimes big patients, they, they need a big speculum and then you might need to have like a, a metallic ones, uh, but that's fine. Uh, if you can see well, the, the tubes, that's fine. Okay. Let's talk about, oh, one other thing I wanted to, to ask about. And I think you mentioned it. At what point can patients resume intercourse following the recanalization? 48 hours after the procedure will be fine. 
Okay. And then we mentioned complications. So let's talk about success rates. So presumably these patients are diagnosed when they come to you with infertility. So they've been trying for 12 months. They haven't been able to get pregnant for 12 months. How do you counsel patients? And then what does the literature say about like our success rates on this? So our success rate in terms of reopening, and here's very similar, it's between 7 to 9% of the case. So it's very high that, that we can reopen the two. But it doesn't mean sure. that patient will get pregnant after, right? Of course. And when, when the patient had prior surgery or reversal tubal ligation, then this rate drops to 40 to 70%. And Technical uh, success rate, right? Toxic, yes, exactly. In terms of pregnancy rate, uh, then it's very variable. The average in the literature goes from 30% in some center up to 60% in other centers. But it's very difficult because uh, we don't follow up these patients, right? We know that many of them will get pregnant, but uh, they may have other problems on, behind that. And, uh, and sometimes it doesn't mean that the tube, it's because you open the tube that they're going to get pregnant. And it doesn't mean that because they have the tubes open, they're going to get pregnant as well. So it's very difficult to have this number. But in the practical settings, what we see is once we open it, we definitely increase the chance of get pregnant. Got you. And are some of these patients, I mean, I imagine this could complicate things, but I imagine that sometimes these patients could be on like adjuvant medications to improve their chance of like, you know, fertility medications. And so I didn't know if that was like common to use fallopian tube recan in as an adjunct to like fertility medications to help patients get pregnant. Yeah, that, that's why it's really important to have a gynecologist on board and even a, in the fertility center or something. But and, the, and they're going to see that sometimes we can't open it. We, we just can't open it. And this patient end up having in vitro fertilization. And then and, and that's, that's part of the game, right? Absolutely. So if patients are not able to get pregnant, do you sometimes see these patients back for repeat HSGs and repeat recans? Or is it you've tried it once, once you've opened it, you've given your patient, you know, your best opportunity, your best shot, and, and that's it. Is it a one and done thing or is it, someone you can see back for multiple sessions, potentially. We do see them back because by the papers, we, we know that reocclusion can occur up to 6% of the patient. So the patient, mm -hmm. and, and the one thing that we forgot to talk about is why this have this mucus, right? They, they produce this mucus usually because of uh, pelvic inflammatory disease and uh, infection like chlamydia or other stuffs. So this patient can also have it occluded again and sometimes they, they came back and they reopen it. And then, yes, we can do it uh, multiple times and yeah. Okay, good. Is there anything else that we didn't mention? Because I feel like we've, we covered the topic pretty well. I mean, clearly it's, it's a procedure that's important. I feel like there's, there's a little bit of reticent for interventional or reticence for interventional radiologists to take these cases on because I think that just the pelvic area, like especially when you're terms of, you're talking about like, you know, cervical access, I think more people feel comfortable with common femoral or radial access than they do cervical access. So for any audience members out there who are a little bit hesitant to take this procedure on, what would you tell them? Like, what are some tips that you can give them to like, this procedure is important. It's not as tough as it seems. Yeah, exactly. So what I can tell you is it's a very easy procedure. Like uh, for, for us with IR training, it's very simple and easy procedure. So it's, it will not take you that long. Of course, for the first and second to, and third time, it will be tricky to, you know, to get the, the cervix and to, to open it. But after a couple, you're going to be very comfortable doing it. And I encourage all the, the audience to do it. It's very important. Okay. And uh, it's a very simple and cheap procedure. And it's going to change the life of this woman forever. You know, for those who have kids, they know how important it is to have kids, right? And these women are trying for years and years or months, and they want to, to get pregnant. And if you help them with a simple technique that's going to take us like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, why not to do it, right? So here we are doing, and we do it a lot. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's like, we do it the first procedure of the morning. It's very quickly before uh, set up the big case in another room, we go and we do it in 20, 30 minutes and it's done. So why not to give this woman this, this hope of getting pregnant? And, uh, and also it's important for, for us, you know, like at this patient, they get very happy and they're going to tell everyone about you. They're going to, it's a very, it's very important to us. And, uh, and for the gynecologist. 
uh, the gynecologists they are very happy with our results and they start to give us more confidence and they're going to for sure send more and more patients and in the, the future send us patient for you fees and, and other stuff. So I encourage all the, the colleagues around the U.S. Uh, do it. Try to do it. It's very simple. I know it's not exciting as, a, as a, a vascular procedure, but it's very important. It's very important. You're going to help these ladies and it's very gratifying for us, for sure. I think that's, I think that you said it in a lot of different ways, but it's, it's a procedure that carries a very small amount of risk with it. There's a big upside. Uh, there's a call, co- a medical cost savings factor associated with it. I mean, uh, not every person, uh, family can afford in vitro fertilization. And when you compare the cost of, you know, a, a natural or a more natural pregnancy or a uh, fertilization method, like, uh, fallopian tube breath canalization with in vitro fertilization. I mean, I think that there's just a lot of upside, very little downside. And like you said, this is within the skill set of just about every interventional radiologist who can, you know, use a comfy catheter. So exactly. So let's, let's start doing it. All right. I like it. So, uh, to our audience, thank you guys for listening. I, I, I totally agree with, uh, Renato, very important topic. And, um, we actually have a great overview of this uh, procedure on the website. You can find that at backtable.com and just look up fallopian tube break canalization. There's a lot of resources in terms of like procedure prep, uh, how to do the procedure, a couple of video demos on that. So check it out if you're interested. Um, again, those are at www.backtable.com. If you guys enjoyed the podcast and want to support the show, here are two easy ways. First, take one second, hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening on. This helps platforms like iTunes or Spotify know that you, our audience, value what we're doing and you're interested in getting our latest content as we're putting it out there. Second, if you're really getting a lot of value from these podcasts, please go to iTunes and leave us a short written review. This helps us in a lot of different ways. Plus, we love the feedback. That wraps things up. We'll see you next time on the Backtable Podcast. Renata, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Aaron, for this invitation. It was great, great talking and I hope I answer all the questions. If not please send me an email or visit my LinkedIn. I will be happy to assist you guys to start in doing this procedure. Thank you very much. Really? Hey, can we take you up on that? Can we put, can we uh, post your, um, like maybe your LinkedIn uh, sure, content, sure. like in the show notes? Oh, of course. All right, you heard it here. Can. You heard it here. Renato yeah, agreed to yeah, it. Yeah. So <laughs> anyone who's interested, any crazy IRs out there, you can uh, you can look this guy up. We'll uh, link to, um, not his personal email account, but you know, maybe a LinkedIn or maybe his um, uh, McGill sure. uh, email account. All right. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don. Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Zubi Syed. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson and Vivek Prasad. Social media and PR by Anne Dang and newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.